close to your side so heaven is real and death is a lie i want to hear voices of angels above singing as one singing
Good afternoon and welcome to the virtual closing worship experience of the 17th session of the North Texas Annual Conference. Under the dynamic, forward-thinking leadership of Bishop Vashti Murph McKenzie and Dr. Stan McKenzie, we're glad that you are joining us. This has been a challenging year. We have launched out into the deep. We have conducted hundreds of Zoom calls and the internet has become our virtual sanctuary. The word has gone forth to the uttermost parts of the world. We're literally in the midst of an Acts 2 experience because the world is hungry for the living bread. And once again, we are gathered in the name of the Lord to worship him. The doors of the physical plant may be closed, but the church is still alive and well. Will you help us spread the worship experience around the world? We want you to be an active participant Encourage your neighbor. You may not be able to grab your neighbor by the hand, but you can hit the like button, the share button, start a watch party, invite your friends. And if you're viewing on YouTube and have not already subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. I know that God is going to move in a mighty way in this worship experience. I don't know about you, but I need to hear a word from the Lord. So I'm waiting. I'm leading in with tiptoe anticipation to see what God is going to do in this worship experience. Come on, saints. Come on and magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together, for he is truly worthy to be praised. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come just thanking you for your goodness and mercy. Lord God, we just thank you for who you are and whose we are on today. Thank you, Lord, for waking us up today to a brand new day that we'll be able to come before your presence with singing and joy and scripture, Lord, praising your holy name. Lord God, as we are here today, we come to a close with in this annual conference. We will never forget what we have had to face this year, the year 2020. A pandemic we have had to endure the deaths of many of our family and friends and those abroad and many of our fellow citizens here in the United States we couldn't meet at our churches and we had to go through some strong emotional things because of the killing of black men and women which was at the forefront of our lives. And we couldn't meet in our churches. But God, you fixed it. You told us in your word to go and spread the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth. And when things shut down around us, we couldn't meet and greet and help each other. But God, you fixed it through Facebook, Twitter, Messenger, Zoom, YouTube, and other forms of media, we have spread the gospel all over. And you have been with us all the way. Thank you, Lord, because in this pandemic, we were able to share food with others, give out masks to some, some gave clothing, some gave financially to help families in need. Some fed those in their communities and the people donated their time and the food for these communities. We were able to tell others and throw and show them that God loves them, that he hasn't thrown them away, and we love them too. It was a work of faith. And God, we understand that it was your work. It was through your almighty power that we could act spiritually, not in our own power. And thank you, Lord, for transforming us, reviewing us, the regeneration that has been within us, the resurrection of our inner man so that we could help other people. This has been and is the work of God, of God. 
They're taking away of the stony hearts of man. And they're giving heart an infusion of spiritual life. A formation of Christ within our souls. And the implementation of all grace that there is. It has been good to us in its effects. It makes us good men and good women. And has qualified us to perform good works. You have given us meekness for a heavenly inheritance. I pray, Lord, that the inward man in each one of us will, re will be renewed day by day. Letting the seed that is within us remain in us. A root which is out of sight and be oil in the vessel. Lord, I pray that every good man and woman be confident both in themselves and in others, that God who has begun the good work of grace, that a work begun with these saints here in the state of Texas, that there will be fruit coming from this good work, because surely seeds have been planted here in the state of Texas. And I pray that we shall grow stronger and stronger and that we shall not depart from what you would have us to do. Because we know that from your word you said you never leave us nor forsake us. So we ask, Lord, that you bless our bishop, her spouse, and her family. Lord, I pray that you bless this district as we go forward in our work for you. As the bishop, my bishop, Vastai Murphy McKenzie, gives us a word from you on this day. Lord, I pray that we receive that word and get understanding. May we get Godfidence. Godfidence in what we hear will be the results. Godfidence will be the result of our understanding. May the grace and the mercy of God and the love that he has for us follow each one of us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We just want to welcome in the Holy Spirit and do some praise and worship on tonight. We want to lift God up in this place and give Him some glory. Say yo. Sing with me. 
128 verses 1 and 2, where it reads, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. The word of the Lord comes from the book of Philippians, the first chapter. Now read verses three through six. And it says, I thank my God upon remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading and the hearing and the doing of the word. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's time for us to worship God through our gifts and through our giving. And uh, uh, giving is a part of worship and praise. It was J.C. Kraft, head of Kraft Cheese Corporation, who had given approximately 25% of his enormous wealth and money to the church and to Christian causes for many years. One day it was Kraft who said, the only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I have given to the church and to the Lord. End of quote. So in other words, the more we give, the more God gives back to us. As we approach this opportunity to give, in this annual conference closing offering. We are asking you today for a gift of $50. There are several ways to give. First, we can give on our cash app, which is dollar sign, 10th spelled out, 10th district AME. And then of course there's Givelify, which is 10th, 10th spelled out T-E-N-T-H, 10th District AME Church. And of course, we can always mail in our offerings to the district office at 4347 South Hampton Road, Suite 245, Dallas, Texas, 75232. Remember, giving is a part of worship. And today we're asking you to give $50 to this closing off offering. Thank you so much. God bless you.
Hello, I'm Reverend Middle Seaman Senior, presiding of a Teen Tower District of the North Texas Annual Conference. My task is to introduce someone who doesn't need any introduction. She is a loving wife, a loving mother, grandmother. She's a prolific writer, a entrepreneur, and she's a great motivator. So help me to welcome at this time the right Reverend Vashti Murphy McKenzie. Praise the Lord and welcome to our opening worship service of the 17th session of the North Texas Annual Conference. I hope you're praying with us, praying with all the clergy and all of our lay people, our missionaries and our young people as we deliberate this weekend. Now let's pray. Oh, Lord, is in your hand. Do what you desire to do, that your word will go out and will not come back void. In Jesus name, together we say amen. Amen. The word of God comes to us tonight from the book of Exodus, the 14th chapter, verses 21 and 22. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through uh, the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Our text then is a part of that verse that says, all that night, the Lord drove the sea back. And our theme and thought of meditation tonight is, I'm counting on it. I'm counting on it. Beloved, welcome to our rock 
and a hard place season. Yeah, 2020 has been a rock and a hard place season for us to navigate. But the rock that I'm talking about, I'm talking about is our solid rock that we metaphorically recognize as Jesus the Christ. Our rock in a weary land. I'm not talking about the rock that's a hard place, that's a pain, that's suffering, but I'm talking about our rock in a weary land. I'm talking about the one, the choice stone, a precious cornerstone, says Peter, and we who believe will never be disappointed. We are between that rock and a tested stone, a costly cornerstone, a living stone, rejected by humanity, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. I'm talking about the rock, the rock whose work is perfect. His ways are just the rock of our strength and a refuge, our rock of habitation. Yeah, we got some rock and hard place times going on, but we are between the rock and those who fall on this stone will be broken to pieces and whoever it falls, it will scatter them like dust. The rock, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for those who stumble, stumble because they are disobedient to the word. Yes, we're between Jesus, the stone that the builders rejected that has now become the chief cornerstone. Let the church say amen. And this came about from the Lord. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Oh, it's not a bad place to be, beloved, that if trouble is on one side, uh huh, uh, you're going to want Jesus to be on the other. If there are hard places on one side, we want hope on the other side. If we're stuck between disappointment and something else, we want that something else to be a choice stone, a living stone, a precious cornerstone. Cause if we believe we will not be disappointed. However, usually when we say we're between a rock and a hard place, you know, between a rock and a hard place, between a rock and a hard place, we're talking about being between two different uh, entities. Yeah, we're talking about between two dilemmas, between two equally harsh options. It's a, it's a position between what we either don't want or we don't like. And our options are few and non-existent. It's a location between demanding realities an unforgiving circumstance in either direction. It's life at the corner of disappointment and desperation, the place of fear at the edge of doubt, the place where things didn't work out and never will work out in a million years. That's a hard place, you know, between the devil and the deep blue sea situation, between two uncomfortable propositions, the lesser of two evils in the land of two unsatisfactory options with your back against the wall. You painted yourself into a corner. You're in a fix, a pickle, a rut, call it whatever you will. You're in a difficult circumstance and the prognosis doesn't sound very good. And here, and here we are, between basic incompetent leadership that prides itself on bombastic proclamations, yeah, uh, that to distract uh, the public's attention from the real issue, a hard place of walking a fine line between what is legal and unlegal activities, hard place, using social media as policy making too, with a sense that something is going on or has gone on that undermines our confidence in our democracy, our national security, which needs constant ego stroking, reminiscent of Nero playing the violin while Rome burns. Now it's more like a reality television show where we get to watch the star vanquish their enemies every day. So we are in that rock and hard place season between what you got and what you don't want, between what you need and you don't have. You know what it's called? It's called a conflict. That, that's exactly what it's called. It's called a conflict. And conflict is a marvelous word that comes from a Latin word, uh, meaning uh, a Latin word conflictus, meaning to strike two things at the same time. Conflictus, Latin word, meaning to strike two things at the same time, to strike two things at the same time. So, so when there is conflict, what do we do? We want it to be over as soon as it begins. We want done in two weeks, done in a day. We're impatient with conflict because it always demands confrontation, whether it's now or later confrontation. Uh, when there is conflict, our ease of dis-ease depends upon where our focus lies on the problem or the solution, on the issue or the issue makers. We don't like conflict. No, we don't. No, no, no. When there is a conflict, we take our pain and multiply it by 10 and 20. 
writes one author, and then we hand it over to everyone uh, that we can. So we, we tend to share our conflicts and share our pain. And many times what is hurting us, what is hurting us becomes hell for somebody else. Ah, what's hurting, what's hurting us becomes hell for somebody else. And, and we pass it on. When there is conflict, we're looking for clarity because we need to see what, what is really going on between those two things happening at the same time and hoping for a bounce back factor after the stress and strain that we call resilience. You know what resilience is? That elasticity of a rubber band. We want to recover. We want to get back to the things the way they were. But maybe we don't really need to get back to normal. Maybe we need a better normal than the normal that we had before the pandemic. But maybe, just maybe, what we need the most is unwavering trust in the rock. Did you hear what I said? I said an unwavering trust in the rock. The one in the weary land, the tested stone, a costly cornerstone, a living stone rejected by humanity because uh, it's a choice and precious stone in the sight of God. The rock whose work is perfect, his ways are just, the rock uh, of our strength and our refuge, the rock of our habitation. But beloved, understand one thing, unwavering trust is a rare and precious thing, writes Brennan Manning. Yes, uh, because unwavering trust is, often demands a degree of courage that borders on the heroic. In other words, uh, uh, unwavering trust is not like any other kind of, of trust. It, it's going to take courage. It's going to take chutzpah. It's going to take backbone. It's going to take heroic courage. Unwavering trust. Good God Almighty. Where do you go to buy unwavering trust? Is unwavering trust in the stores yet? Is it being sold online? Uh, have the promos for unwavering trust started yet? Trust. Yeah, I can do that. With, with all my heart, mind, and soul. Yeah, but unwavering trust. Yes, I can lean not unto my own understanding. Uh, Y'all recognizing Bible here? Uh-huh. Uh, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, but, 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 but unwavering trust. If I commit all my ways to you, uh, you will make it unto success, but unwavering trust. Trust in him, and he will act. But unwavering trust. <gasps> That's unshakable trust. It's bulletproof trust. It's unbreakable trust. It is reliable trust. It is unshakable trust. It's a trust that the wind cannot blow away. The rain can't wash it out. Fire can't burn it. Mudslides can't overcome it. And death doesn't even come near unwavering trust. When the shadow of Jesus' cross falls across our lives in the form of of some abandonment, some, some, some kind of rejection, some betrayal, some denial. When that shadow of unemployment or loneliness or depression, the loss of a loved one, when we are deaf to everything but the shriek of our own pain, when the world around us suddenly seems uh, like a hostile, men menacing place, at those times we are between the harsh realities of living two things the corner of desperation and desperate. At such moments, the seeds of distrust are shown, are sown. It requires a heroic courage to trust in the love of God, no matter what is happening to us or what is happening around us or what is happening to others. Yet, yet when these kinds of things happen, we forget that Jesus never asked his disciples to trust in God. He demanded trust. That's what John tells us in his gospel in the 14th chapter in the first verse. Trust in God and trust also in me. Trust then was not some, some cute little feature that walked around the edges of the teachings of Jesus Christ. No, it, it was its heart and center. The desire for clarity often is an attempt to eliminate the risk of trusting God that is a matter of the head, fear of the unknown. The path stretching ahead of us continues 
uh, to sow those seeds of distrust because we can't see what the end is. And that's a matter of the emotions. Trust. Wait now. Wait, pay attention. Trust does not dispel confusion. Trust doesn't eliminate darkness. Trust doesn't cure uncertainty. Trust doesn't dull the pain. Trust doesn't remove chaos or provide a crutch. So preacher, if trust does not dispel confusion, darkness, uncertainty, or dull the pain, or remove the chaos, uh, or provide a crutch, then what does unwavering trust do? Glad you asked the question. This is what unwavering, uh, unwavering trust does for us. It holds you together until God answers, shows up. It keeps you until God's next arrived. It tethers you so you are not blown away by what happens. And guess what? I'm counting on it. Unwavering trust is a steadfast resolve that has nothing to do with how you feel. Unwavering trust is a decision, not an emotion. It's a made up mind. I got a made up mind and I won't turn back like Donnie McClurkin sings or with a made up mind. I'll go all the way through like Donald Vale sings. It's when I have a flashback to those disco days. You remember, come on, y'all old enough to remember them disco days where they used to hang the marrow ball in the middle of the of the room. And they put on Gloria Gaynor and she'll sing, I will survive. I'm counting on it. What is clear, however, is that the heart of trust is what Daniel did when he sat there in the den of lions, trusting that God will make him, help him get through the night. It's when Sarah stopped laughing. It's when Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It's when David said, yea, though I walk through. When Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. It is when Peter said to the Sanhedrin, we can't help but speak in the name of Jesus and what we have seen and heard and witnessed with what Jesus said on the cross into thy hands. I commend my spirit. It is what Paul says. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him. When unwavering trust, no, 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 no. When faith lives in just the head and misses the heart entirely or just lives in your emotions, it depends on how I feel today, whether I'm able to trust God. Then by faith through grace, can leave you saved, but unchanged. Relentless trust, writes Brennan. Unwavering trust intrinsically brings change. Did you hear what I said? By faith through grace can leave you saved, but unchanged. But relentless trust, unwavering trust, intrinsically brings change. It then becomes our gift back to God. Ah. So when you said yes, when everyone around you said no, and when it looked like no was the best deal, but you said yes to God anyhow, it's your gift back to God. It's when you went without knowing and, and going without being fully sure of the outcome, that's your gift back to God, is standing instead of giving up. It, it's singing in the spirit because I'm happy I sing because I'm free. It is praising God in spite of what you have seen or heard. This is your gift back to God. It's walking anyway among your enemies. It's speaking the truth in love anyway to your haters. It's preaching in season and out of season. Come on, preachers. It's your gift back to God. It is, it is, it is being in the spirit on the Lord's day when you're the only one there on the Lord's day. It's preaching into a camera instead of preaching to a crowd. It's your gift back to God. It's being careful for nothing, but when you have every reason to be careful, it's your gift back to God. 
It is standing on the edge of your circumstances between that rock and a hard place surrounded by mountains like the folk in Exodus 14. Your enemies are coming quickly behind you. There's nothing but a sea in front of you. And all you can do is trust God. Not just with any trust, but with an unwavering trust. Come on, let's, let, let's engage the text, shall we? In our text, the Hebrews were marching out of a pandemic that lasted too long. Led by Moses, the displaced son who arrived in Egypt because of the hatred of his own flesh and blood. The hated one received title, position and royalty over against his rock and hard place situation by Pharaoh and became the linchpin that kept his family alive in the middle of another pandemic caused by a famine. And in spite of the rescue from famine, the future of God's people would be in Canaan, not in Goshen, not in Egypt. As God had promised, uh, they were no longer treated as welcome guests in Egypt, but are now free labor, economic pawns to build temples and pyramids and serve the slaves to meet Egyptian needs because a new Pharaoh was elected. I mean, in the, ang- in the language of the biblical text, a Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph. And I'm always amazed at how God gets you from point A to point B. Hmm? Have you noticed that when God's trying to get you somewhere, it is not necessarily a direct route. Sometimes it looks illogical and it feels illogical and it is illogical from a human point of view. You know, God told God has already told you what's up. This is the way Follow in it. This is where we're headed. Pick up your cross. Follow me. This is what I have plans for you. Not to harm you, but to prosper you. Uh, Here it is. I'm going to give you a future and a hope. And they got out all right. They did. They got out all right. But all too often, the direction that God takes us has a lot of twists and turns. It's risky, maybe even dangerous. It's challenges with a lot of backtracks to go back over places you've already been before. Backtrack over the same direction, almost where you started from. And that's exactly what seems to be happening in Exodus as we approach our text. It is not Moses, but it's God through a divine cloud that directs them to a trackless wilderness surrounded by an impossible barrier of mountains and a sea. And for us, that's just like turning into a dead end street, a dead end street of compassion fatigue, pandemic fatigue. Yeah, pressure Glory to God on every side. And Moses does what? Moses prays and gives direction. Fear not. Find that place deep where faith will rise above. Don't fear where fear is not in control of your emotions or your decisions. Stand still. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord with unwavering trust in our God. Ah, as you wave it, not when things were going your way, but watch, watch, keep your eye on the Lord and not just on your enemies and hold your peace. But there is just some stuff you need to hold on to. Yes. Until your trial becomes your testimony, until your test becomes a testimony, until your trauma becomes a testimony. Wait, wait a minute, God. Wait, 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 God. Um, Is that the battle plan here? Can't you hear the Hebrews talking among themselves? Um, We walking out here in a trackless wilderness. and, And all we have is the stuff we carrying in our arms and on our backs. And 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 this is how we're going to survive against Pharaoh's army, against chariots and horses and spears and archers. That's it, God. We're trapped between immovable objects and our enemies are breathing down our backs. And God and God says what? Yes. But this is what brings us to the text. Come on, Mo. Help us out. 
Moses, you stand between the rock and the hard place. Moses, you stand between the rock and the hard place. Come on, prophet. Stretch your hand over this conflict, striking two things at the same time. And the text says, and God worked all night <laughs> to drive back the sea with an east wind. What did God do all night? He held back the water. What was God doing all night? Let me suggest, the, let me suggest an answer. What was the Lord doing all night long? God was doing what was humanly impossible. God was doing for them something they could not do for themselves. You know that there are some things you can't do for yourself, right? Now, the, the, the command to watch, the command to watch, be still, fear not. Now, now, all of a sudden, that starts to make sense. Because if your eyes are always on your problems, you may miss the possibilities God is developing on your behalf. If all of you look, at, if, if all you're doing is looking at the pandemic, you might miss the opportunities that emerge because of the pandemic. As multitasking people that we are, our minds can only focus on one thing at a time, whether you believe it or not. Boy, but in the back of our minds, I tell you, we're going like a mile a minute, aren't we? Yes, we are. The more choices we have to make, uh, the more difficult it becomes to make a decision. Uh, we make it hard for ourselves. So, so we're focusing on one thing, but in the back of our minds, we say, do, do you think we ought to run? Do we think we ought to stay in one place? Do you think we need to move? Do you think we need to fight? Uh, uh, do you think we need to just go talk it out with Moses or go cur curse Moses out? Uh, we lose our ability to help ourselves out. So God says, just look for me. Watch me work. The Hebrews had already seen how God works when the Nile turned to blood and the gnats and the locusts came when dark covered the face of the deep and the, and the death stalked the streets of Egypt. They had already seen how God's work. The same way uh, that the Lord's uh, disciples watched Jesus. Yeah, watch Jesus work. Water turned into wine, blind eyes opened, a man by the pool of Bethesda got up and walked, lepers were healed, children loved, the accused woman had her sentence commuted, and haven't you seen God work in your life? If you're busy trying to work it out yourself, you just might get in God's way. So the Lord says, stand still and watch me work. Otherwise, we go try to negotiate with Pharaoh and the army of, of standing firm with unwavering trust where God just goes out of the window. And blame God, you brought us to this place. And God says, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. And watch me work. Remember, beloved, the prophet, the process of deliverance is often illogical. It looks illogical, feels illogical in human terms. But in divine direction, there is still nothing Impossible with God. Watch God work. Be still. Hold your peace. Take a deep breath. Step back. Get a grip. Pray. And notice that Moses prayed, but the people complained. The Hebrews cried out against Moses and the Lord. You did this to us. It's because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in this trackless wilderness. Whatever happens, don't forget what the Lord has already done. God has already helped us. He's fixed stuff for us. He worked things out for us. He showed up when showing up time was needed. Uh, he planned things that worked out. He went ahead of us. He protected us. He saved us. Yes, yes, yes. The Lord has already done things for us. And I tell you, when I think of the things that the Lord has already done, uh, I shout all over again. The Lord has been good to us. And I'm glad when I think how he saved me, I shout all over again. When I when I think about where grace met me, I shout all over again. When I think how he healed my body, I shout all over again. When he kept me from going over the edge, I shout all over again. When he worked out what I thought was unworkable, when he opened a door that had been shut against me, when he gave me favor in unexpected ways, when blessings showed up undeserved, when he answered my prayers or the prayers I forgot to pray, I shouted all over again. When I think back today, Somebody ought to help me shout because God has done some stuff for us already. Think about all the things that God has done for you. 
and then shout with me all over again. All the impossible things that the Lord has done. And sometimes he's done it over time. And sometimes he did it overnight in the midnight hour, turning things around and around and around. And I'm counting on it. What was the Lord doing all night long? Well, the Lord was was doing what was humanly impossible. And the Lord was doing what needed to be done so the Hebrews could do what they needed to do for themselves. Wow. Uh, he was doing some stuff for them so that they could do some things for themselves. God did something. God held back the seat. On one side was a wall of water. On the other side was a wall of water. But he didn't do everything for them. There was some stuff that they had to do for themselves. God was going to create a way out. God was going to create a way through. And they were going to have to take their worldly goods themselves and walk to safety themselves in a dangerous place themselves in the middle of the sea themselves. But one wall of water on one side and another was going to require heroic courage, unwavering trust. Yes, a leap of faith that will back you against the wall and everything will seem to be against you. Huh? And whoa, Lord, your enemy is breathing down your neck. But all night long, God was working it out so they could do what needed to be done. They were going to walk it out. God will work on your issues. God will work on their issues. <laughs> God will work on our issues so that, so that we can go through to the other side of the issues. There's some stuff we're going to have to do for ourselves. Getting everything ready for you not to have this problem again. That's a shout right there. Because it says it in the text further down to Exodus 14. The enemy you see today, you will see no more. Oh, God's going to create a path that's going to make it away. There's some stuff you're going to have to do yourself. Uh, like vote <laughs> yourself. Some stuff you're going to have to do for yourself. What was God doing all night? Those things that were humanly impossible. He was doing some things so they could do the things that they needed to do. What was God doing all night? God was getting the future ready. <laughs> I don't know about, about tomorrow. I just live from day to day, but I know who, who has tomorrow in his hands. The command was to tell the people move forward. Period. Tell the people to move forward. Isn't that all we can do now? Let's move forward. Let's not, let's not go back to another season, another time. Let's not go back to another decade. Let's not go back to another century. But let's move forward with unwavering trust. Their future was in front of them, not behind them. That's a shout for somebody today. Somebody who believes that their future is over. Everything is done. That's it. Your future is in front of you. It is not behind you. Their future was not defined by their present pandemic or their circumstances. The future that was coming was going to be greater than the one they had experienced. Yeah, when they went into Egypt, they went into Egypt as a dysfunctional family at the behest of a displaced son. But now they got out with hundreds of thousands of millions. They came out a nation. Their circumstances didn't create their future. It was Created by the possibilities and power of God. God created a path to the future ah, through a big sea. How big, how big was the sea? I, I don't know. How wide was the sea? I, I, I have no. I, I, how long? I, I don't know. How, how, how shallow was it at, the, at its most? How, how deep what was it? What, what, I, 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 I don't know. But one scholar believes that three and a half million people, if they walk two by two, it would take 35 days and night to get to the other side of the sea. But if they walked 5,000 across, they'd make it to the other side in one night. You may not be able to explain the grace of God, but don't you love to experience God's grace? When grace shows up, what about you? I'm counting on it. 
You may not be able to explain how favor works, but aren't you glad when the Lord favors you? I'm counting on it. You cannot explain why the Lord forgives the unforgivable, but aren't you glad when you ask for forgiveness, the Lord will forgive you. You can't explain how the Lord knows when to show up in your life, but I'm counting on it. All you know is that the Lord will make a way somehow. Yeah, I'm counting on it. That the Lord can still help at helping time. I'm counting on it. He can do some things overnight. I'm counting on it. All you know is that the Lord will hide you when you need to be hidden from your enemies. All you know. Oh, oh, glory to God. That you're not qualified and the Lord will qualify you. I'm counting on it. People acting crazy. Yet God keeps you in perfect peace. I'm counting on it. As Dr. Cecilia Williams Bryant writes, the silence of churches during this distress, the complicity of our judicial system, (laughs) the compliance of the media and the pre-existing conditions of our own brokenness, rage and moral fatigue is creating a perfect storm for the unbridled fires of hell to be released. God, show yourself strong to defend us, to keep us, and to bless us in the name of Jesus. Have mercy on us. Have mercy upon us. Merciful Father, I'm counting on it. All you know is that on your resume are some me too moments. But because God so loved you better, that moment doesn't define you nor determine your future. All you know is that what should have killed you didn't, and God kept you. Oh, I'm counting on it. Every dream, every idea and vision has the shadow of resistance. But God can create a path through impossibilities and create possibilities unimagined, never seen before. And when it is all over, God will get the credit, not you, not any organization, not some company. No, God will get all of the credit. Thank you, Jesus. And then we can dance and sing like Miriam all night long. I'm counting on it. Beloved, God is still at work. He is still at work in our lives all night long to bring you, all night long to bring you to safety. I'm counting on it. No matter what it looks like, No matter what it feels like, as illogical as it seemed, go grab your unwavering trust and believe that God is working to bring us to safety. And I'm counting on it. Yes, I am. I'm counting on it. Praise the Lord, Bishop, for such a mighty word, a mighty word from a mighty God. As we're here together, we're praying that the confidence that God has in you will help you to make the choices and decisions that he's calling you to so that he may indeed complete everything that he has for you. If you're here this afternoon and you've never had the type of relationship with God that would help you to have that confidence in him, We invite you right now in the comment section of your screen to type, I need you now. And for those of you who your confidence may be a little shaken, you may not believe right now that God will bring to completion everything that he started in you. You might think it's too late or I'm too tired or things have changed so much but remember we're talking about God Almighty so if that is your desire 
to come now to him, understanding that he can do all things, then just type, I'm on the wheel now, God. We all are but clay in the master's hand. So let's give him the opportunity to complete in each of us the masterpiece that he's already designed. In Jesus' name, we bid you come. Good afternoon. So much has happened. We have seen so much during this time together, during this session of the North Texas Annual Conference. God showed up in some major ways. God did some miracles that we did not see coming. God kept us in crises and trial and tribulation. And better yet, we discovered that God is not through with us yet. Our theme for this annual conference session is Godfidence. We heard about the possibilities of God. And we celebrate in confidence that if God began a good work in us, oh, I don't know about you, but that's my shout, that's my testimony that God is not through. God will see it through until the end. Bishop McKenzie, we thank you so much for that powerful word. Did not disappoint, did not let us down, but challenged us and charged us. We're grateful for you, for the gift that you have of leadership and, and for preaching and proclaiming the word of God. We've seen so much. We've, we've, we've celebrated. We've, we've mourned the loss of some of our members. We've, we've worried a little bit, but more importantly, we were able to come together to thank God for all of the great work that God has done. And you allowed us, St. Paul, to be a part of that. You allowed me to stand and to host in this session. And we are so glad about it. Bishop McKenzie, thank you so much for allowing us to serve as hosts. Dr. Stan McKenzie, thank you for your leadership and, 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 and your guidance. To all of the heads of leadership at the 10th District, to my presiding elder, Walter McDonald, and for those who serve in leadership in the North Texas Annual Conference, thank you so much for allowing us to serve in this capacity to be your host. Now, we've done the work. We've come, we've came, and we've reported. But now it's time to go. And, and as the old saying says, before we became, uh, before we found ourselves in this situation, you don't have to go home, but you do. Yeah, I think you know how, how the saying goes. We pray God's blessings over your life. We are grateful and glad that we're able to move in such a way that God was glorified in this session. I look forward to seeing each and every one of you soon, and my prayer is that you take care of yourself. Protect yourself. Don't do anything that God does not lead you to do. But more importantly, just sit back and watch God do great things in our lives. God bless you, and I will see you soon. Paul Quinn College is a movement. Our mission, the reason why we exist, is to prepare our students to join us in the fight to eradicate poverty. We understand that we stand on the shoulders of giants, so we do not get the choice to be small. The only way that we can fulfill the promises that those giants made and the dreams that they had for this country is to band together and address the issues of the day. The number one issue of this day is poverty. For the first time in America's history, the majority of its students come from poverty. Therefore, the true measure of our success in higher education will now be our ability to serve the poor. If you grow up in poverty, if your life is defined by scarcity, you don't have the luxury of time. Our students are the roses that grow from concrete, and those roses need us to walk in their gardens, not in ivory towers. The most important innovations, even in higher education, are those that move people out of poverty. That is why we've created our own version of higher education. We are the world's first urban work college. 
We created an academic program called Reality-Based Education so students can see how the things they're learning in class are relevant to their everyday lives. We created the Urban Work College model because our students needed not just to have an education, but to have the skills to succeed for a lifetime. Work colleges are distinctive in that students are required to work in addition to go to class, and that work becomes an integral part of their academic experience. Our students graduate with an academic transcript and a work transcript. Because of the work program, our students also graduate with jobs. They graduate with the skills, with the ability to do things that will permanently move themselves out of poverty. Because while I respectfully understand why some people think education cures poverty, the one thing that time and time again has been proven to cure poverty is money. Not only are we changing the way students pay for college and the way they obtain work experience, we've also changed the way curriculum works. We did this by creating the Quinite Arts. Now at Paul Quinn College, we have writing across the curriculum, speaking across the curriculum, reasoning across the curriculum, and building digital mastery across the curriculum. This means that every single class that our students take, they're required to do those things. Let me tell you a little bit about my students at Paul Quinn College. 85% of them are Pell Grant eligible. 70% of them have zero expected family contributions. 98% of my students are either African American or Latino. We are a national institution where over 40% of our students come from outside of the state of Texas. Another 20% come from outside the city of Dallas. So what we're doing every single year is asking ourselves these questions. Are we getting it right? Are we serving our students in the best way possible? Are we being good stewards of their faith? Are we raising the bar? You do that by making sure you're addressing their needs and the needs of the communities that produce them. We knew that our community was in a food desert. We were closer to the city's garbage dump than we were a grocery store. So we transformed our football field into an organic farm, which now includes a 5,000 square foot greenhouse. As wonderful as our now is, our next must always be greater than our now. We want to create a network of urban work colleges located all across this country. The reason you invest in Paul Quinn College, the reason you believe in the dream of a Quinnite nation, is because you understand that we are winning. You invest in Paul Quinn College because this is your opportunity, this is your ticket for a place in history. So when people come here and they're like, I want to be a nurse, he's going to be like, but why not a doctor? And that's the type of mindset that you have to have. People should look at you as if you're a little bit crazy because your dream is so big. If you actually want to make change, then this is the place for you. My dream is to end poverty. I've been told you can't end poverty. You can just make a dent in it. Listen, I pity those individuals who are the souls that don't dream big enough that they want to solve the great problems of our society. People who are crazy enough to believe that they can change the world, they're the ones who do change the world. This is who we are. This is what we do. Welcome to the Quinai Nation. This has been an extraordinary journey in the 10th Episcopal District. Thank you so much for being with us for the North Texas Annual Conference. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Please join us as we are getting ready for our commissioning service, as we'll be assigning pastors to their congregations for the next annual conference year. Praise God for Paul Quinn College and your support. And please continue to support uh, Paul Quinn College through our GiveLify and our Cash App for our GAP, uh, GAP uh, scholarships for our students, as well as the free testing and the feeding that we have been doing all spring long. And so, my brothers and sisters, now let us look to the Lord. May the grace of God be ever amazing in your life. May the love of God be everlasting. May the mercy of God meet you every morning and may goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life until we all come to dwell together in the house of the Lord forever. And together we say amen.